Okay, uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Ask the Pediatrician's Life. Uh, this beautiful Saturday morning, I am Dr. Bemi Salaboyede, and it's my pleasure to be here this morning. And uh, today, we're going to be talking about developmental delay. And as usual, if you have questions about your child health, or oh, especially in the area of development, you can kindly join us now. You can drop your questions in the comment section and I will uh, feature them and I will address them as well. I uh, will encourage you to share the video and um, you know, invite family and friends to be part of this because I know this is one of those areas that parents have lots of questions. And if you are watching on our live party, uh, or the watch party rather, and you have a question, uh, you can just click on the video so that you can drop your question directly on the video. Uh, some of our moderators will also assist us in copying and pasting your question directly under the video so that we can feature them and we can answer them. So once again, you're welcome to Ask the Pediatrician's Life. I am Dr. Bimisala Boyde, and we'll be talking about developmental milestones and developmental delays in children today. Okay, so um, my moderator is having some technical challenges in join, joining me on the live show. I don't know whether I should be able to make it, but because of our time, I'll just have to start and I may go solo for some time, then hopefully. Uh, she can join us. And if you want to join me in the studio, you just let me know. I can drop you a link to be a guest on the program. All right. So today we're going to be talking about um, developmental delay in children. And like I rightly said, uh, there are two things that make children very unique. I mean, for us as pediatricians, because sometimes people want to look at children, if you want to come to medicine as little adults, but children are not little adults. You know, children are completely unique on their own. And when we talk about things that make children unique, there are two basic things that make children unique. One, children grow. And one of the second things that make children unique is that they develop. And those are the two features uh, that make children quite different from adults, that make them not small adults, but make them completely unique on their own. And so those are the two things that pediatricians are always very interested in. We're always interested in children's growing. So that's why each time you come to us or you go to the hospital for everything, you see us checking the weights, checking the heights. We want to be sure that the children are really growing. So that's very important. And I know we've talked about child nutrition. We've talked about growth. We've talked about, we've talked about it several times on how to feed the children, how to make them grow. Now, today I'm going to be talking about the second unique feature of children, and that's how that children develop. And what do I mean by development? So when a child is born, the child is born completely an helpless human being who is completely dependent on another human being for everything, you know, for feeding, for every everything that that child needs to survive. The child is completely dependent at birth. But within a few months and years, that same child becomes a completely independent adult or 
uh, human being. So the process by which a completely helpless child, uh, human being, changes to the stage where that individual is completely independent is what we meant by development. So we, you all agree with me that when a newborn baby is born, baby is born as three kilos averagely and it cannot do anything for themselves. But in another one year, that same child is now about 10 kilos and that child can walk on his own. The child is talking, is calling mommy and all that. What has happened to that child? The child has that go one was called development. And that is very, very key. And most parents, of course, we are very interested in children development. Whether you like it or not, you are always doing developmental assessments. So you see mothers, they are looking at the child. Oh, my child is now walking. Oh, my child is now having uh, teeth. Oh, my child is doing this. And you are looking at another child, maybe that was born around the same time. And you see mothers sometimes trying to do a lot of competition about the children and all those kind of things. So those are those, so that is what uh, um, is that is what uh, development is all about. And so uh, all mothers or all fathers, all parents are by default doing developmental assessments all the time, and they are trying to to see whether their child is growing or not. Okay, so. Um, <clears throat> Uh, but when parents now discover that maybe the child is not developing, it's not acquiring uh, some of the what we call developmental milestones as the child should, then they start getting concerned. And that's what we talk about developmental delay. And so, uh, but for you to know whether there's a delay or not, that means that you have to know what is average, what is normal, because I, I'm going to tell us some facts when it comes to development so that you will now understand when we talk about developmental delay and usually when parents discover that maybe oh this child that was born around the same time like my child is not doing this is not doing what another child who was born around the same time is doing they start getting worried and they start calling on the pediatricians and these are some of the things that we get a lot of questions on so basically uh there are some things we need to understand first about development uh, thank you, Chairman, for joining me. I can see your comments. So if, as I'm going on, if you have questions, you can just drop your questions for me in the comment section, and I'm very, very happy to take them. Thank you so much for joining me. So I was talking about development. So when we talk about development, development has to do with what? The maturation of the brain. It has to do with the brain. So it is the brain that is maturing that is actually... Uh, what development is all about. It is, uh, okay, I think my moderator is available now. Let's see whether she can join us. Hello, Felicia. Hello. Okay. Um, I'll see whether I can bring her hand later on. Hello, Felicia, can you hear us? Felicia, can you hear me? Okay, so I'll continue with my um, with what I'm discussing. And Felicia, when you can hear me, just say something, and I know you can hear me and you're with us. All right. So um, when we talk about development, there are certain things we need to understand about development. So development has to do with the brain develop it is it is more or less the brain now majority of the body of the structures of the body is is already uh fully formed uh at birth and so but the part of the brain that is not fully formed at birth is the brain so the brain of a child is still growing in the first six in the first uh, three years of life the brain is still maturing and it's still this maturation of the brain that causes what we call the development of the child so it is the brain itself that is maturing that leads to the child being able to do some of those things that we eventually see the child doing or what we call development so now there are so number one we need to understand that development has to do with the brain and what that why is that important is that any problem that affects the brain of a child 
we in, in, invariably affect the child's development. So for children who were born with, uh, maybe they didn't cry at birth and they suffer brain injury, there was no oxygen to the brain and all that, they will invariably suffer some, uh, the development may be delayed. Okay, another thing we need to understand that development occurs from the top to the bottom, you know, what we call kefalokoza in medical jargons. But basically what that means is that for a child to develop, it, it, it follows certain sequence. So a child will be able to keep the neck straight first before the child will be able to sit. Then the child will be able to sit first before the child can crawl. And then the child will be able to crawl first before the child can um and stand and then the child will be able to stand first before the child can uh can 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 uh, walk polisha can you hear me now yes so yes ma good morning okay good morning. can you please increase the volume okay so basically that is what uh, development is all about so it is it follows certain sequence and there are certain um what i call like markers along the way in other words there are Different, what we call milestones. In other words, that is that milestone. That when the child gets to another age, the child goes to the second thing. So those are what we call developmental milestones. So the way we monitor development is through those milestones. So those milestones are like our markers to know whether the child development is on track or not. That is normal. So I'm saying I want to say, and I'm going to talk about the development of my students. And my students development of course in different areas. So there's what we call the gross motor development. Now gross motor is the child being able to see, the child being able to crawl, the child being able to walk, the child being able to run. Anything the child has to do with movement, mostly we call it gross motor. Then there's what we call the fine motor. Fine motor has to do with the hands. The, anything the children are able to do with the hands. So initially when children are born, they are born with their hands fixed like that. They are you see them close their hands, but very soon you see them open their hands, you know, by three, four months. Then later they start to bring the hands together. Then when they want to bring when they want to then later they start moving out their hands. So that's when you start giving them rattles and then they shake it. And initially when they want to pick something, they go with their whole hand to pick it. Then later they start doing what we call the pincer grabs. They just use just one the forefinger and the thumb to pick things. So then later they can hold the pencil and initially when they hold the pencil, they hold it like that with all their palm. And then later they can hold it the proper way you are not doing. So this is what we call fine motor development, what the children can do with their hands, you know. And then we now have what we call the speech development. So speech development is the child is born, they don't have any, they don't say nothing, they don't have any language. Then later they begin to make sound, the coos, and sometimes they begin to laugh. Then later they begin to babble. Uh, ba, 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 as if they are talking to you, but you couldn't make any sense out of it. Then by the time the child is one year, the child will have his first word. And then by the time the child is two years, he's combining words. And by three, four years, they are speaking full sentences. So this is what we mean by uh development, uh, you know. So these are things that these are the different areas of development uh, of development and then we also have a call personal social the child being able to do things for themselves so initially like i said they are completely dependent on you you feed them you do everything for them then later the child will begin to eat by themselves then later they begin to know that the diaper is wet they want to take it out then later they begin to you know, get potty trained, they can go to the toilet by themselves and all that. Then later they can dress by themselves, they can take their home baths. So this is what we call personal association and self-help skills. They begin to have friends, they begin to have so many things. So, so these are the various areas of development of my soul. So sometimes parents always worry about only one particular area. But for us as pediatricians, we look at development in all those areas. We look at all of the areas. And one thing we need to know that sometimes a child development may be delayed in one area alone, and may, or the other areas will be fine. So, so you see a child who work at nine months, but the child is not talking at three years. So that is only one area delayed. But sometimes the developmental delay could be in all of those areas I've mentioned about. So that means it is across what we call a global uh, developmental delay. So these are key features that we need to know first when we talk about development. I'll quickly take some of the questions and then I'll come back and continue from where I stopped.
Alicia, can you read? Okay. okay. Lawson Abraham is asking, should we be concerned if our daughter, one year old, is not creeping? Creeping? I don't know. Like that. You mean crawling? Okay, so thank you so much. Now, this question has brought to fore what I was trying to say, uh, which is another uh, thing I want to say. Now, development occurs in sequence. In other words, so a child will have neck control first before the child will sit. Then we have what we call sitting with support where you guide them with the pillows. Then you have the sitting without support where they can sit by themselves and balance well. Then they will go to crawling. And some children may not even crawl. Then they go to standing. Then they go to walking. So those are the sequence. Now, even though all developments occur sequentially, but they may not occur at the same time. In other words, it's, the timing may vary from one child to another child. Even though they all occur in the same sequence for all the children, but the time that each child achieves each particular milestone may be different. And I think this is very important for parents to guide. Now, what, what that means is that a child, uh, what we now as pediatrician do is that we have what we call average age of achieving a particular milestone. So, for example, we'll tell you that neck control is three to four months. In other words, some children will start having neck control maybe around two and a half months, some around three months, some around four months. So it's a, it's a range. But all children will have neck control first before they go to sitting, before they go to crawling, before they go to uh, walking. But each child, some may decide to have their own neck control at two months, some may decide to have it at four months. <clears throat> as long as they are still within what we call the average range, we are not going to worry about that. So that is fine. Now, but we will not have what we call a limiting age. In other words, there is now a like maximum cutoff for us. Like if at this particular age, this child has not yet achieved this particular milestone, then it is a red flag. It is something that a pediatrician needs to worry about. So for example, the limiting age for neck control is six months. In other words, if a child has not achieved neck control by the time the child is six months old, you should see a pediatrician. But if your child is three months and you come to me and you're worried about neck control, I'm just going to reassure you that let's give the child a little more time. So it's important for parents to understand that children have different needs. So you see some parents, if the children are not working by one year, they start to get worried. Now, one year is the average age for a child to work. But as a pediatrician, I'm not going to worry about the child not working until the child is 18 months. So the, you will only start seeing the pediatrician worried if, because some children work at one year, some children work at nine months, some children work at 13 months, some children work at 14 months. They are still all within the average range, and that is fine. But if by 18 months, the child has not yet started working, then we now start seeing see a pediatrician. So back to Lawson's question, should we be concerned because your child of one year old is not yet crawling? Yes, I'll be concerned because the limiting age for crawling is actually that one year. Usually by nine months is the average age for crawling. Most children crawl eight to nine months, seven to nine months actually. So if a child is now supposed to be walking, and I will tell you how to know because sometimes it's very difficult for parents to know. But the way we normally, the this is just like a, a rule of the thumb is like, if at the time a child is supposed to have a particular milestone, the child is not yet developed the milestone that preceded that particular one, then I will worry as a pediatrician. I'll, I'll break it down. Basically, what I'm trying to say that I expect a child to be working as one year. So if a child is not working as one year, I'm not worried. But if the child is not doing what the child should have done before the working, which is the crawling, crawling comes before working at one year. So I expect the child to be working at one year, but even the crawling that is supposed to come before the working, the child has not started doing that. That is a red flag. And that means that child development is delayed and I need to worry about that. So, um, uh, 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 that child needs to see a pediatrician because uh, it's 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 safe. It's a flag already for delay. That's for Lossy Abraham. Okay, I have so many questions already, so I will start taking my question quickly. So, 
Oluwa and Jai is asking, at what age should a child start talking properly? Okay, thank you for your question. Once again, you're on Ask the Tradition Live for those who are just joining me so that you know what we're talking about, developmental delay. And if you have questions, you can ask me. Um, so a child, uh, I will give us the... Uh, actually, for parents, you don't need to know all the long, long ones for pediatricians, but I'll give you some quick, you know, quick um, um, developmental milestones markers for speech and language. So most babies should start cooing. Cooing means they just make, mm, they just make all those sounds by three to four months. Then babbling should be about eight to nine months. Now, the first word, most children say their first word by the time they're about one year old. So at age one year, a child should have one to three words. So the child should start saying things like mama, baba, and things like that, or maybe one name of a sister or something like that. They should have at least one to three words at one year. By two years, they should start combining words. So they should start saying two words. So very simple to remember, one year, one word. Two years combine it to words. So you child start saying, mommy, biscuits, mommy, go, mommy, car, you know, two words together, that is two years. By three years, a child should start saying a sentence of three words. I want water, I want biscuits, uh, I want to go, that is three years. By four years, a four-year-old should be talking like an adult, should be speaking full, completely, clear sentences a three-year-old should start speaking sentences but the three-year-old sentences is as well because clarity maybe about 75 percent clarity so you people in the family will understand the three-year-old better than a stranger but at four years the child should be talking that even a complete stranger should understand a four-year-old talking should be able to speak with good grammar and everything a five-year-old should be able to tell you a story a five-year should be able to come home and tell you everything that happen at school, recount events and all that. So if you see your child not doing any of these things at this particular ages, one year, no word, then you worry. Two years, not combining word, I will worry. Three years, not yet speaking sentences, I will worry. Four years, who is not talking clearly like an adult, I will worry. So that is the age. So when you say you should start talking very well, I guess you mean talking in full sentences and all that, then I will say, uh, by two years, they should start talking, but by four years, they should start talking very well like an adult. I hope that is uh, clear uh, for uh, Uluwande Ajayi. Okay, uh, now Shama is asking, how much effect does the age of parents act on development of the brain and subsequent development of the child? A very important question. Now, uh, the age of the parents really doesn't really have any effect on the child's brain, but I know where you are going. Now, children that are born to older parents are prone to having genetic disorders. So, well, for example, we say mothers uh, after 35, they are, they are likely to have children with Down syndrome, and Down syndrome means uh, they usually have developmental delay. So it is not the age of the parents per se that is directly affecting the brain of the child or the development of the child but it's the fact that people who are older when they have children their children are likely going to have developmental challenges because of the genetic problems so uh so that is the reason so it is because of that so if you if you're an older uh, mother uh, and what we call elderly mothers they have a baby but the baby does not have down syndrome or the baby does not have any genetic disorder then that baby development is going to be absolutely normal the baby is not going to have any other problem but it's only a baby that is born to an elderly couple and because the child's um have uh what's it called uh genetic disorder like down syndrome and all that then that is when that would be an issue. Sorry, I'm, I'm I'm struggling with my scroller. Okay, so that is I hope that is clear. So it is not the age of the child per se. It is, I mean age of the parents per se having the brain having effect on the brain. It is the fact that if other parents have a child with genetic disorders like Down syndrome and all that, then genetic disorders tend to come along with developmental disabilities and that is where that will be a problem 
Very good question. Annie Igwe is asking me how more, can too much screen time affect a child development? Well, this has been a lot of this has been a lot in the news lately, and definitely yes, we we pediatricians feel like you know sc uh, screen time definitely affect children uh, development because children develop by learning from others. So there's a there's a lot of development, really the social interaction, the language, it comes through interaction with adults. So what's happening is that in adult interaction, in human interaction, let me not say adult interaction, it could be interaction with other children, there's a back and forth, there's a feedback, you know, you say something, you get a response, you get, you know, but with screen, it's a one-way traffic. There's really no much of feedback, though there are some apps that do give some feedback, and even speech therapy do use some apps. But we don't want children to, we know that screen can be good, can have apps, you can learn, but we don't want children watching TV, 24 7. we don't want children um being babysitted by the tv and usually most uh, pediatric association recommend not more than one to two hours of screen time a day for most children so we we don't want you allowing the children to use too much screen please so uh there initially we there have been lots of um uh recommendation but these days i think like the uh royal college of pediatrics and child they just brought out their own recommendation and they try to move away from saying a specific timing because what works for one family may not work for another family but generally we want you to limit screen time for children let it not be more than one to two hours a day because it affects their ability to develop socially it, it affects, because there's no feedback most time coming back to them all right okay so uh somebody is asking okay chairman is asking that is there um a problem a concern when a child seems to have too much advance no that, that is not uh a problem uh chairman because uh we have what we call gifted children even though gifted children could also be a problem because they have their own area where they have challenges. So some gifted children could actually be quite advanced. But what we really want is that the advancement is unique, you know, across all boards. So it is it is not that the child is only talking and the other areas are delayed. No, but it's across all boards. That is what we want. So the most important thing is that it is a uniform development. So, but there's no concern. Yeah, we, we call them gifted children. So that's the meaning of students who are really a little bit uh, faster than the other children. And I don't think you need to worry so much. Yeah, we, we do know that kids like that. Okay, Anna is asking, what's the average number of teeth a one year, 10 month old men to have that is not, yeah. Okay, thank you so much, Anna. So teeth development is also, well, developmental. Yeah, I guess I can take it as part of developmental, but so it's more of a physical or growth thing. So um, by that age of two, because the child is almost two, they should have the full complements of the uh, of the of the uh, mixed it twenty. That is what they should be having. So uh, you should not worry. But but then the dentist will tell you don't worry because everything is a range. Everything is average. And for children generally, we don't worry so much about mixed it because they are going to lose them anyway. And when they lose them, they are going to have permanent teeth. So I think the most important thing is that they will have permanent And I don't know why parents always worry a lot about teeth, how many teeth their children have. I've never seen an adult who don't have teeth, have not, apart from elderly people when they lose their permanent teeth. So what I'm trying to say is that you don't have to worry about teeth or number of teeth because all children will eventually have all their teeth and they are going to lose them and then they are still going to develop their permanent tooth anyway. So what we recommend is that you see your dentist when the baby is one year old. But mothers worry a lot about it, and I don't think it's something you need to worry about at all. All right, I'm moving on. Uh, Grace is asking, what can make a child of four years who can speak well? Yeah, thank you, Grace, for that question. So there are many, many causes of speech delay. There are many, many causes. If you were listening to me at the beginning, I was trying to say that sometimes uh, delay delay in the development I, I talk about the what we call the domains of development in other the different areas of development so speech is just one area so we have what we call the gross motor the walking the running the riding bike and all that we have the fine motor the use of the hands the writing the drawing shapes using cutleries and all that 
Then we have the speech and language. And speech and language is understanding first, what we call receptive language, and speaking it out, what we call the expressive language. Most parents always worry about expressive language. They don't worry about whether the child actually understands fair, which is what we call receptive language, but we worry about the two. Then you also have what we call the personal social skills. Now, a child, if a child has isolated, in other words, it is only the speech area that is delayed, then you, you call it um, just isolated speech impairments or things like that. But most times, sometimes the child who, has, who is not talking well may also have delay in other areas. So if some children have, um, maybe they didn't also work on time or they didn't do so many other things on time. So there are many reasons why children could have all these delays. So it could just be speech delay. It could just be, it could also be a delay in context of other delays. Like the child may also be slow in other area. The child may also be, we also have cognitive, which I didn't really mention about, but that is about learning, ability to learn, ability to understand. So these are all the different areas of uh, so what are the things that will cause it anything that affects the brain has birth could cause it for example if the child uh, didn't cry as birth if the child has severe jaundice if the child has meningitis if the child has a genetic disorder anything that causes brain that affects the brain even if the child fall and eats their brain and all those things those are the things that could cause uh any brain injury especially in the first what we call the developing brain, the first three years of life, or even sometimes we can extend it to the first five or eight years, anything that affects the brain, even prematurity, being born premature, all those things that affect the brain can cause developmental delay. Also, uh, sometimes it's also be due to lack of stimulation. So children that are born in, maybe due to nutritional deprivation or lack of stimulation by parents, you know, what we call emotional abuse and things like that, all those things could also cause children's development to be delayed because children also require stimulation for them to develop. You need to talk to them. So they, you shouldn't be sitting there with the TV or the screen. They're not going to talk because they don't say they need to talk to anybody anyway. So those are the things that can cause uh, delay. Uh, so many, so many, it's, it's, there are so many of them. So, but what I would normally recommend that if a child is not talking, you need to see a pediatrician, preferably. A developmental pediatrician so that we can do a proper developmental assessment and when we do the developmental assessment we can figure out what is the cause for that child sometimes we don't know the cause anyway but the most important thing is that we address the the child's um, needs as well so i'll go on with the question now Okay. The next question here is by Ching Wei. Um, Ching Wei is asking, what makes each other four years not to express his feelings? Oh, that sounds like uh, what Grace was asking. So, um, so feeling is, is more of a, um, how would I put it now, is is still under communication, but we call it social communication. So if a child is not expressing feeling and all that, I would think of a child who has possible, um, what we call um, um, uh, autism, for example. So that child definitely requires uh, further assessment. So it could be a child with autism spectrum disorder and things like that. So. What, what what I'll just say generally, because I know you're going to be asking me a lot of this kind of question is, there are many causes of developmental delay in children. And it is for us to know the cause, what the developmental pediatrician normally do is that we take a, a what we call a history, we ask a question right from the time the child was in your womb to the time the child was born. What are the things that happened when the child was born? What are the things that happened after the child was born? How has the child development has, how has it been like? Did, was the child developing well before and suddenly stopped? Did the child fell ill? Like, for example, I have measles, malnutrition. 
the child was developing perfectly well, then maybe along the line the child had measles or had meningitis, then developments will go down, what we call developmental regression. So we need to ask all those questions. We need to examine the child. Even sometimes just looking at the baby, we see the face, oh, the, the face is widely spaced, mm, you know, the child is have low set ears. We, what, what we see, dysmorphic features, then like a child with Down syndrome, immediately we now know, oh, this child developmental delay is as a result of Down syndrome. So it is after doing all this, I'm not giving you a sneak preview of what we normally do, what we call a developmental evaluation. It is when we do all this evaluation, we can now tell you, number one, whether the child has developmental delay. Two, whether the child, what is the cause for the developmental delay. Sometimes even from the history examination, we may not know, we may still need to do tests, we need to do genetic tests, we may need to do blood tests. It is when we do all that, sometimes we do brain scan, we will now know the cause. Not all the time, but sometimes we need to do some of those tests. When we do all these tests, we know the cause, then we can now tell you this is the cause. Sometimes we can't do anything about the cause. In fact, most times we can't do anything about the cause. What we can help the child you know, which is developing. And that is where all our other professionals come in. So we have like a child who is not talking, we need a speech therapy. If a child has problem with their gross muscle, they will need what we call the physiotherapy. If the child has problem with their fine muscle, they may need occupational therapy. Sometimes some children have problem with their behavior, they need behavior therapies, clinical psychologists. So these are some of the things that we can do to help the children. I hope that is clear. <clears throat> so I will keep on going on and answer some of the questions I have now. Yeah. So um Annie Igwe, so how do we correct it? I was watched TV almost all through her life for two years, 17 hours daily. She babbles and uses one letter word. So Annie, uh, this child was emotionally neglected. It is child abuse by the parents. So it is the fault of the parents. Uh, yes, I can say that. But what we now need to do is to now re rehabilitate the child. So the first thing is this child obviously is two years and has only one letter was the child has some speech delay of maybe due to lack of the uh, stimulation and all that. So I would number one recommend that this child should see a speech therapist we will evaluate the child and we'll start working with the child. And of course, let's start showing the child, um, uh, what's it called now? Let's start showing the child love, stimulation, take the child out, let the child have a lot of play with other people and all that. So I, I hope that is um, that will be helpful. All right, let's move on. Um, the next question is by Hannah Amaka. Amaka Noram is asking, uh, is every speech delay obsessive? No, no. That is a simple answer, no. In fact, it is, let me shock you further by telling you that this is not all autistic uh, individuals that have speech delay. So I, I am a developmental pediatrician I, and I do a lot of autism assessment and I see a lot of autism that have no speech delay. So. Autism and speech delay are not necessarily the same thing. In fact, most times children with autism may not have speech delay, but they don't use their speech for social interaction. So the problem with autism is about is social, is social communication difficulties. And uh, maybe and I will come back and do autism is, is a whole topic on its own, but not today. But let me just say for now that uh, autism is not speech delay. Okay, and speech delay is not autism. I know a lot of people get it confused. So there, are, so people, so because the reason why I have to say that is that there are a lot of people that people, once a child is talking, they don't believe the child has autism, but that is not true. So there are people that are talking but can still have uh, autism. Okay, only one day is thanking me for the clarification. Thank you for listening. I'm happy that you were able to get the uh, answer to your question. Uh, let's move on. Uh, uh Omolora Kwadan is asking whether this is part of development. Yeah, you can you can say it's part of development, really. And I, I, I will say it's more we have what we call more of a physical thing than yeah, so it's okay, it's, it's still part, so you don't need to worry about that. Yeah, it's more it's, it's more of a growth, it's more of a growth thing because when we talk about growth, growth is about acquiring structure, getting bigger, getting all that, you know. But you know, development is about the brain itself maturing and giving you, you know, giving you skills. It's about developing skills. 
So maybe that will make it clearer. Development is about developing skills. So a child is not working before can now work. A child is not talking can now talk. Where our growth is about becoming bigger, having you know, you know more structures in your body. So I think it will come under growth really. But don't worry about the the terminology. So let's just leave it. Okay. So uh, Adeyemi is asking whether can a what can delay a child of sixteen months. So a child of sixteen months. Like I said, I will not worry. So, so let's have a saying that sometimes some people are delayed, is is what we call familiar. In other words, in their family, people work late. That is just the way they do. So I've seen a lot of people will tell me, oh, in our family, everybody talk late. We don't talk for the three years. And eventually when they start talking, they will talk. So we have what we call late bloomers, people that are just a little bit slower doing things, but they eventually get there. They will they always get there later, but they eventually get there, and there's really nothing wrong with them. So, but for a child who is not working, I will worry when the child is 18 months. If by 18 months the child is not working, then I know that this, because we are giving the child allowance, we're giving the child extra time of six months. So, if to for, for those who are late bloomers to catch up. So, if the child is still not working at um, 18 months, then it is not just that the child was just a little bit slower, then it means that there's something maybe going on. And that is when they develop, we we'll do what we call development evaluation, which I've already talked to you about. It could be, it could be so many things. So it could be cerebral palsy, it could be anything. But I don't want, it could just be even just develop, uh, what we call global development delay, because we have to look at, apart from the working, what are the other areas as well? So that's what we talk about. So, Kenny is asking, uh, me, so I want to know at what age your mom be worried about a child of one year yet to walk, crawling, moving, while holding something, but yet to stand on his own. So I'm not worried about your child, Kenny. That look like a child who is, who is just fine. Because like I, we, we, you really made, you mentioned that you came in late. So for example, um, the child is already uh, cruising. Cruising is an 11 month old, 11 months old uh, skill. So that means the child is going to work very soon. And like I told you, there's an average age for doing everything. And when I used to jokingly tell parents, like when they make, uh, you know, when they compare their children with all, I'll ask them, why, why are you also not like Dan Gose and, you know, have all the money? In other words, we all do things at different uh, phases. So uh, the fact that a child work at nine months does not mean your own child must work at nine months. As long as your own child still work within the normal time. So for us pediatricians, we have a average that we give everybody. So we say average is one year, but some people will do it at seven months, some will do it at nine months, some children will do it at uh, 14 months, some do it at 15 months. But we will not worry, but we have what we call the limiting age. So what I want parents to take away from this is the limiting age. At what age should I worry? when my child is not doing this thing. So that is what you need to know. And like I said, if a child is not working at 18 months, then that is when a pediatrician will worry. You know, if a child is not yet talking at all at two years, then we will worry about that, okay? So those are the, the limiting here. So from, and the most important thing is that the child is doing the other things. So the child is already crawling, the child is already standing, then there's really no need to worry. I think you should just not worry. Okay, uh, Jennifer is asking about the teeth. I think you should not worry. And like I really tell you, you don't worry. Teeth is not a problem at all for children. Okay, uh, uh, Jennifer is asking a very good question. She's saying, does the birth weight of a child have a development rate? Yes, very important question. So children that are born premature uh, have a lot of problems. Uh, they may have a lot of challenges with their brain. In fact, we, we deliberately monitor premature babies or babies that are born what we call a small for gestational age. We, we deliberately monitor them because their brain is a very fragile brain. And sometimes a lot of problems can happen to the brain. And it's good. In fact, uh, children that are born below one kg, what we call extremely low birth weight babies, most of them have. Um, <laughs> Most of them have uh, 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 what we call cerebral palsy. Fifty percent of babies that are born extremely low birth weight, that is below one kilo, we have cerebral palsy. It's, it's, it's a confirmed fact. So basically, what I'm trying to say, Jennifer, is that uh, babies that are born too early and especially born too early, born too small, 
they are prone. They're, I'm not saying 100% because we have seen a lot of them that have shocked us. I, I had a baby um, that I did development evaluation for. This baby was born pre -term. This baby was um, having a lot of what we call apnea. So the baby was, in, in other words, the baby was dead. The baby would die and we would resuscitate the baby. So we were really so worried. You know, sometimes, you know, as pediatricians, sometimes we see some we see some things and we also believe there is God. No, so this baby was almost left dead. As far we think the baby will not make it because the baby was having so much apnea. But you know, we we usually don't give up on time on those babies. So we just keep resuscitating and eventually this baby made it home. Fantastic. But when that baby has gone through those kind of challenges, we are worried that this baby is going to have a lot of developmental disabilities. So we, we closely monitor their development. We don't even just leave it to chance. We deliberately bring them back for developmental evaluation. So I did the developmental evaluation of this child at two years. My God, this child was perfect. This child was doing everything above even what we expected so this is this is just like a very you know interesting miracle to us we even have to write it up so what i'm trying to say is that we, normally we expect those things because of the challenges that baby has i would have expected maybe we have developmental disabilities but sometimes they, you know those babies just surprise us and they're fine so but definitely any baby that is born premature any baby that is born small requires to have um developmental monitoring but your baby is not that small 2.26 is just okay. It's not that bad. I'm talking maybe like 1 kg, 1.5. Those are really the very small baby that I really want to walk about, talk about. Okay, so when you're asking me questions, try and keep it short and simple. You know why? When when your question is too long, when I project it on the screen, everybody will not see my face anymore. You won't, you won't see her. So like I can be a day, your question is a little bit too long. Just keep it short and simple. Okay, so uh, you can ask the second question, like an, another comment, so that we can say thank you so much. Um, she's asking me, what is the thank? Good morning, good morning, Kemi. What is the difference in the relationship between development of my son and children? Because some people we because my child was sick, he or she wasn't able to work on time. Yes, and uh, yeah, what precaution do we put in place when? when about reaching a mass so i personally always make my house free from objects on the floor um when the child is calling what's mama thank you so much i have to cut out your question now because so i can see i like to see people seeing me when i'm talking all right so kemi has asked very important question very very valid question so number one she's asking uh uh what is the relationship between sickness and i think development of my son so yes you, you are right sometimes when children are very ill um when children are sick it can affect their development it can set them back so we know that so it is it's very easy for children to regress when they're sick and there are certain sicknesses that when children have them then they they develop uh, they they are more at risk of having developmental delays. So, for example, children that have meningitis, cerebral malaria, any child that any sickness that affects the brain, measles, and all those kind of things. When it affects children that way, it can uh, those kind of children can have uh, developmental regression. So that is very valid. So what we normally do is that when your children are, when children are sick, when they recover, it's important that you take them to uh to the pediatricians for follow-up so that they can be monitoring the child and make sure that everything else is fine so that is one thing then you are asking what do you normally should do when the child is um uh when the child is about to develop a milestone what should we do of course you are a very intelligent and very uh sensible parent so you what you've done is completely right so you need to you need to keep your child uh your home child friendly or child proof your house that is another topic on its own I, I don't even want to go into that so there's a concept we call child proving your house you need to know that when children are at certain age they are prone to doing so many exploration and so because of that to prevent them from getting themselves injured or from taking poisons and or from having unnecessary injuries and things like that then because they are exploring which is good you should not kill you should not keep the exploring spirit that's how we learn 
we learn by exploring, but you need to make sure that in the process of exploring the environment, they don't get themselves into unnecessary trouble or get injuries. And that is why you need to shite proof your house. So I think I will just come back another day and talk about how do we shite proof our house? Because what you rightly said is okay, you know, when you have a crawling baby, all the things on the floor should be half, you know, take all your stuff, all your china, all your uh, very fragile glasses, they have to be stored away. So uh, you, you make sure the child have their own room where they can do play. Some people also have a play pen where you can, you know, open it and you put the child in the play pen, it's a little bit secured. So that's another topic, but I am happy that you asked that question because it's a very, very sensible uh, question. So uh, we'll come another day and talk about which I proved there. There's still a lot to do. Okay, so um, Ada is asking, what of a child that is not growing tall? Okay, that is growth, not development. But I'm happy you have said because height, I'm sure Dr. Ongwama will come and talk to you later about that. Height is a function of your own height and that of your husband. So if you are not tall, you can't expect your children to be tall. It doesn't matter whether they eat all the food in the world. So there's a way we calculate what we call mid parental height. So there's a height of the mother and that of the father. We had it together. There's a way we calculate it. And that will determine what we expect your child's height to be. And then we will plot it. So it is if your child is not growing like at the level we expect their height to be, then we talk about short stature. Now, short stature on his own has so many causes. So, what, so there are many reasons why a child will not be tall, starting from nutrition to some genetic conditions to so many other causes, but I will not go into that today. But just suffice to say, if a child is not growing like you expect the child to grow in terms of their height or their weight, your pediatrician is your friend. You should always go and see them and then uh, let them you know, evaluate that child further. Okay, she was asking a follow-up question. Uh, actually, the child comes when it was from. Unfortunately, uh, she was, I, I can't even remember what your first question was now. Uh, but you said the child comes when the child was four months. Are you advising that I go for a brain scan? Like, am I? No, I'm not advising anything. I because I don't even know. I, I, even right now, I'm just trying to remember your first question. <laughs> so, um, I can't. Uh, I don't know what really happened to the child, but. Doing a brain scan or whatever is the pediatrician. Are you the one to ask whether a four-year-old is not talking? Yes, I think I remember that. Okay, so if if your four-year-old had conversion and now has development side delay, there, there may be a link. There may be a link. For example, the child could have had meningitis or other problem at that four months old, which maybe was not properly treated or something, or maybe it was treated, but you know the child developed complications anyway. So what I would recommend is you see the pediatrician first. That, so, so so parents always want me to tell them what to do. No, there's a process for doing all these things. So like I said, the process is that you see a pediatrician who will do a proper history. It may not even be the conversion. It may even be something else. It, it may be what causes the conversion in the first place anyway. For example, let me give you an, a scenario. If a child already has a brain abnormality uh, at birth, it is, is that brain abnormality alone may cause the conversion. Or it may also be the reason why the child is not talking now. So it's a complex web. So, but the best person to figure out what to do or what not to do is your pediatrician. So I would recommend that you, you get to see the pediatrician first. When you see the pediatrician, then the pediatrician will recommend what you can do and what should be done. And of course, what other therapy should be done. Thank you. Okay, Shukura is asking, in a child of nine months, no neck control, that is significant developmental delay, uh, and I'm worried. So that child should be seen by a pediatric the pediatrician, preferably a developmental pediatrician. If you don't have a developmental pediatrician, a pediatric neurologist. But I think a teaching hospital is always the best place to go for such children because such children requires um, what we call multidisciplinary care. In other words, you require many professionals working together. So the child will require physiotherapy, the child may require other things. So because of that, it's better to be in a, in, a, in a setting where you have all the specialists together. So you have the pediatrician, you have the neurologist, you have the, the uh, physiotherapist, you have all that. And you know, there may be a reason why the child have that no neck control. Maybe the child had jaundice or they didn't cry at birth or whatever. So all those things need to be to be um, evaluated. Because like I said, neck control is three to four months. A nine month old should be crawling. So if a nine month old is not even yet having neck control, talk less of sitting, that is that is really severe delay as, 
and that child should be seen by a pediatrician. Yes, okay, so Ola Banji is asking, at what age should you seek medical attention if a child is working 18 months? 18 months. I think I've said that several times. Okay, Shama said I missed a question. I don't know, maybe. How do you want to interpret episode of too much excitement? We not stop babbling for a period of about five minutes or 15 minutes in a child of five months. And the child don't have fever. I don't know that someone mean by too much excitement. There's nothing wrong with a five months old having excitement or not babbling and all that so i don't understand what you really meant by your question uh why are you worried about the child i mean why are you worried about the child non-stop babbling i mean do you think it's abnormal okay that's another thing i really need to talk about because sometimes parents ask us a lot of questions they think it's abnormal and which is perfectly normal so <laughs> there's nothing wrong with the five months of babbling there's nothing wrong with the five months old being excited the child doesn't have to have fever to babble. The child doesn't have to have fever to be excited. Or maybe there's something else that you saw that worries you because sometimes parents have intuition about some of these things. But unless I'm not getting your question, I'm not really sure what is worry. I will not worry about a child babbling or being excited. The child doesn't have to have fever. Yeah, a baby's development can be fast. Yes, and there's, it's not a problem. I, I don't know. Mothers worry a lot about everything. <laughs> so some mothers are worried about their child development being too slow. And we're actually talking about that today. But some parents are not worried about their child development being too fast. And you want me to do that as well. So if your baby's development is fast, fine. There's no need for you to worry about it. So don't don't worry about that at all. So that's it. All right. Hello. Uh, hello, Neno. Thank you for joining us. I think my time is almost gone. Thank you for joining me, Esther. Thank you, Amarachi. Okay. I guess I've answered all the questions. If I miss your question, just drop it now before we go. All right. So I'm just going to recap in it's time is up anyway, but I'm just going to recap. So just to say that this program has been brought to you by Active Pediatrician Foundation. And today we've talked about developmental uh, delay in children. And basically we've talked about the fact that um, there are two things that make children unique. Uh, okay, yes, this is what I was looking for. There are two things that make children unique. Number one, children grow. Number two, children develop. And development has to do with maturation of the brain, which leads to the children acquiring skills that makes them independent. So in other words, a child is born completely dependent, and then that child now develops by acquire the brain matures and the child acquires skills. So a child who was born not talking, not walking, not able to do anything for themselves, by the time the child is five years, the child can walk, the child can talk, the child can do everything by themselves they can put on their own clothes that is what we call development and i mentioned the five um uh developmental uh domains we talk about gross muscle we talk about fine muscle we talk about speech and language we talk about personal social skills we talk about uh self-help skills sometimes we mix them up and make it for sometimes we make them then we talk about cognition that is about the brain learning ability of the children so those are all the uh uh, developmental domains and we talk about developmental milestones which are like markers that help you to track the children's development so if your child is not achieving their milestones as at the time they should be doing it then you worry and you don't need to scratch your brain all the uh, baby's card all those immunization card all those uh, baby's uh, card that they give you in the hospital they have those milestones there so all you need to do is to check and make sure that your child developmental milestones is being achieved, or you can come and ask us on ACP. We will tell you anyway. So and um, what I said that developments are, are, are developments of course in sequence. Sequence is the same for all children. So when I say sequence, it means a child will have neck control before the child will sit, before the child will walk. It's the same sequence, but the sequence, the the timing of each child may be different. So some children may have their neck control at three months, some may have their neck control at four months, some may have their neck control, you know, but we also have what we call limiting age. So it is that limiting age that you as a parent should worry. So if at a, the time, you know, if your child doesn't have their control at six months, then you should worry. If your child is not yet sitting at nine months, you should worry. If your child is not yet crawling at one year, you should worry. If your child is not yet 
um, working at 18 months, that's when you should see your pediatrician. The same thing for speech. If your child has no word at all at two years, you should see your pediatrician on speech therapist. So basically, that is what you need to do. So basically, that's what I want parents to watch out for. Not to be too worried about, you know, maybe if my child walks too early or my child walks at one, one in 13 months. Those are not something to worry about. Focus more on the, on the limiting age. And we also want development to be uniform. So if your child is doing good well in some areas and not doing well in some areas, we will have concern. But if your child is not doing well in all the milestones, then we will have concern. So as I'm running up, um, I will ask, ask her the last questions I have in front of me. How can a child going to four years who is unable to talk well? Like if you have to pronounce some words, you will say another different thing. Is ready. Okay, so uh, it better so let that child see a speech therapist. That child needs to see a speech therapist. That's the, the, the speech therapist can help that child. Thank you. Okay, four year old talks intelligently but can't identify letter sounds and color. And uh, letter sounds. What is letter sounds? Uh, sorry, pardon my ignorance. I know that's what I mean by letter sounds because your child is talking well. That is fine. So, what in my sounds again? So, uh, are you talking phonics and all that? So, you need to clarify colors. So, how much of exposure has that child has? So, some children are intelligent, but because they've not had a lot of stimulation, then they'll be slow. And then, okay, I, I, I mean, I'm suspecting you are you are a teacher. Now, let me also send a warning to those who are teachers because sometimes there are some things you expect children to do uh, because some other children are doing it. Wait, wait. They are not yet at the age they need to do it. No, they should know colors. They should know colors. Maybe not necessarily know all the colors, but maybe the child should know at least a few colors, maybe basic color like red, uh, yellow, green, and all those kind of things. So the child, but that in that case, if the child also has other learning difficulties, the child may have a learning difficulty. You know, maybe the child may have what we call intellectual disability or difficulties but then i really want you to give that child opportunity first have you taught this child and then the child is still not able to do it how long have you done the teaching and all that before you you know you worry so but you may want to get a psychologist what we call educational psychology to assess the child to know whether the child uh, learning is a uh, uh, appropriate so you know everything is not development there's also learning and, and I think learning is the, is the last part. We didn't really talk much about that because usually it depends on what we're doing, what we call a, a, a okay, it says small letter like phonics. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't really worry about that. I won't worry if the child is not recognizing phonics and all that, you know. It's, as long as the child is pronouncing the phonics itself, but recognizing it is a different thing entirely. And I don't think it's age appropriate for a four-year-old to be doing phonics. And I'm sure some of the adults don't, don't know all those things as well. But as long as the child can say it, in other words, if, they, if you, the child knows how to sound out those words, Learning the alphabet or knowing that this this alphabet goes with this sound is not really a four year old skill. Really, I know most time we do a lot of things and we push all the children, but sometimes some of those things are not yet uh, age appropriate skills. But if you really want to know whether that child development is age appropriate or not, the child, you can you can send the child for a developmental assessment, but or have a education a, a psychologist assess the child for possible. Um, um, uh, to, to test the child intellectual ability. So that's the last one. Okay, I, when I'm ready to go, people want me to go. Okay, let me just answer the question. I, oh, yeah, I mean, say, if a baby does not cry immediately at birth, does this affect developmental So Yes, yes. Usually, babies who don't cry at birth are likely going to, uh, we have what we call, uh, what we call bat asphyxia, and bat asphyxia is one of the reasons why children development can be delayed. But it's not all, it's not like 100%. In other words, it's not all babies who don't cry that will have developmental delay. But we need to monitor that baby because babies that don't cry and have convulsions or when in the hospital they needed oxygen, that means that there was some injury to the brain. So when babies didn't cry at birth and have injury to the brain, those kind of babies really need to go to the hospital. Uh, they need to be monitored because they can have developmental delay. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, Chema. Okay. Chema is asking. Sister, who made himself left and right, both in wearing shoes and writing B and D. That child needs to be evaluated for 
uh, learning difficulties, possibly what we call dyslexia. I'm not saying the child has dyslexia, but I will worry about. I will. I will make sure the child is evaluated first. You know. So, so in other words, there's there's developmental delay. Then there's also learning difficulties, which is not necessarily developmental delay. In other words, some people development is fine, but they may have problem with their learning. It's a different topic on its own, so I will not want to go into that. All right, a two year old who babbles very well, but isn't calling mommy or daddy. You know, that two year old is delayed. Uh, I guess patients are just coming. A two year old should be talking, should be joining two words together. So, if a two year old does not have any word at all, it's only babbling, no mommy, no daddy, that two year old is delayed, and that two year old should see a pediatrician immediately and a speech therapist. Esther is asking if my two year old. Um, uh if my child is three and four months and all they can say right now is mommy daddy read a to z and all that yeah, yeah I, I, is the child come for a two-year-old they should be combining words together they should be putting two words together your baby seem a little bit slow one but not maybe not too bad but the most important thing is that the child is going you know is increasing the scale so i would really say if you worry about it you should see a um what's it called you should see a speech therapist you know uh yeah but usually a two-year-old should start joining words together and uh, maybe your baby can read a to z but mommy and daddy is just two two simple words so you should be joining them together and i would really prefer you get a, a, a speech therapist or a pediatrician to evaluate your child remember that some children are just a little bit slower but what we normally need to do is to make sure that at least they are increasing they are getting better but if they are static or going lower then we worry so much about that yeah okay i think i'm done for this morning i'm already going here so just to say that this program has been brought to you by ask the pediatrician foundation and um you, if you still have questions no problem uh you can go to our facebook group if you go to our facebook group you can drop your questions there we are always online 24 uh, 6 we are not there on saturday on, on sundays but monday to saturdays any time of the day you can drop your questions and you can ask your questions i will be happy to answer them uh please do not drop your questions on that the video because we will not be able to answer them but if you go to our facebook group you can always drop your questions and then we will answer them. All our moderators, all our professionals, they're always online 24 6 and they can answer your questions. And if you want to be part of us, you can support us um, because, apart from what we do online, we also do community medical outreaches to indigent children. And this year, we're actually going to all the states of the country and you remember that that's been so on children's day we are going to have community outreaches to all in all the states so if you want to be part of it you can support us and then uh, you can you can support us by being a volunteer you can also support us by uh, donating to us uh, financially i'm trying to look for our candidates so that i can show it to you yes yeah, so you, there are so many ways you can support active pediatrician foundation i will be very excited or if you want to advertise your program or you want to advertise your services on atp life you can also do that i uh, just to say that if you want to watch all our old videos they are available on our Ask Potential Foundation page, or you can go to our YouTube channel. Just subscribe to our YouTube channel. All the previous videos of Ask Potential Foundation ATP Life, they are there, and you can watch them. And after watching our videos, if you still have questions, you can always drop it on our uh, Facebook uh, group, preferably and then we will be able to answer them. So thank you so much for joining me this morning. I am Demi Sola Boyede. I'm the uh, founder and the chief executive for Access Literature Foundation. And if you still have your questions, you can just drop it on our Facebook group or you can email it to us on ax at axthepediatricians.com. Thank you and have a wonderful weekend. Bye.